The last we left Pisistratus, things were looking bad for him. His own city had exiled him twice now, and he was stuck without influence or power in Eritrea, his chances of regaining his former position seeming slim. But all was not lost for the Pisistratids. The old tyrant was just that, old. In his time as one of the most rich and powerful men in Greece, he had made friends. Former associates of Pisistratus were common not only in Athens, but throughout the entire Greek world, and now that things were desperate, he started calling in favours. And Pisistratus had done a great deal of favours. We don't know the details, because of course we don't, but supposedly entire communities considered themselves indebted to him. He asked for money, soldiers, and supplies. His new plan involved no more clever tricks, no more alliances, just force would be how he took power. The city of Thebes was amongst the most generous, providing an immense amount of financial support. Pisistratus took this money, and used it to buy mercenaries from Argos. So things were looking better, but his small force of mercenaries was still not enough to change the odds enough as to guarantee a decisive victory, and the longer they delayed, the more the campaign was costing. Then appeared a stranger in a ship. He came as a volunteer, willing to help Pisistratus if he returned the favour. He introduced himself as Lygdamus, a wealthy soldier from Naxos, a small Aegean island with ties to Athens. He said that he would help Pisistratus become ruler of Athens if Pisistratus would then use the might of his much larger city to make Lygdamus the ruler of Naxos, and then the two could rule as allies and look out for each other's interests in the long term and easily control the South Aegean Sea. Pisistratus agreed, and was glad he did. Lygdamus revealed that he could summon a large number of armed men, weapons, and an enormous sum of money. This not only provided Pisistratus with a force large enough to invade Attica with, but the sight of so many reinforcements and an influx of cash to pay them worked wonders on the morale of his soldiers, who were just a tad awestruck by the wandering Naxian. And so in the tenth year of his exile, Pisistratus, his sons Hepius and Apacus, and his new ally Lygdamus, along with thousands of Argive and Naxian mercenaries, all set sail from Eritrea and landed on the shores of Attica. Here is where the third element of Pisistratus's army came to join him, the people of Attica. Remember that prior to his exile, Pisistratus had represented the poorest farmers who inhabited the rocky hills of the region. Pisistratus had not landed in Athens, but 26.2 miles away at the beach of Marathon. The name's not a coincidence. He made his invasion almost seem like an invitation to that huge and poor class to come and join him, and many of them did. One might wonder why the Athenians were doing nothing, while their former tyrant spent ten years gathering money, hiring mercenaries, or even sailing directly towards them. Perhaps this is because they didn't take Pisistratus seriously, or maybe because they had never resolved the infighting that led to this mess and were too busy squabbling amongst themselves to plan for his return. But either way, around the time Pisistratus starts making inland from Marathon, the oligarchs in Athens start making moves to stop him. They manage to intercept him within sight of the Temple of Athena at Pelene. The two armies then encamped, and in sight of the statue of the goddess that they believe ruled their city, prepared to fight for it. Pisistratus had one trick up his sleeve, though. Supposedly on the advice of a wandering prophet, by the way, uh, ancient Greece is just filled with wandering prophets, and wise men, and soothsayers, and the likes, on his advice, he attacks the Athenians at midday. The Greeks, who in 546 BCE were already practicing the post-lunch nap, usually spent midday eating before playing some dice and going to sleep. And so being half asleep, the citizen militia was taken by surprise and quickly routed. The aristocrats, including Lycurgus, Megacles, and all of their families, fled immediately into exile, and Pisistratus could finally establish himself as tyrant for the third and final time. Now that he had power, he jumped into action using it to pursue the policies he had been trying to push for years. He started with foreign policy, and true to his word, he took his mercenaries to Naxos to easily establish Lygdamus as tyrant to the island. And whether unintentionally or by design, Pisistratus had formed friendly relations with basically all of the most powerful surrounding cities. Eritrea, Naxos, Argos, and Thebes had all directly helped him in regaining power. And now he had it, he continued to cultivate their friendship. He also established alliances with the Thessalians and the Spartans, although the specifics of these agreements are unknown. Good relations with his neighbours was important to Pisistratus. Unlike many other Greek tyrants, he didn't want to forge unity by focusing his city on an outside threat, or maintaining power through terror of military might alone. His policies portray a man who wanted to foster unity through success, and peacetime leads to what Pisistratus valued the most economic prosperity. He used state money to provide loans for the poor farmers who had always been his support base, and this allowed a great many of them to break out of poverty and buy land large enough to support itself. 
Failing that, it allowed them to break out of farming altogether and get involved in the still-growing industries and manufacture and trade. He regularly toured the countryside in order to judge each case on its own. The stories abound, although many of them are probably apocryphal, of Pisistratus travelling Attica, inspecting the produce of each family farm, and deciding whether or not to exempt them from taxes based on their current financial situation. Unsatisfied that his judgement would last forever, he established a number of local courts to decide on these issues throughout the countryside. This was also a subtle dig at the aristocrats, who had traditionally held sway on the local level. He appeased those aristocrats by allowing them to maintain their previous positions, like the archonships. Funnily enough, Solon's constitution seems to have been used more consistently in the reign of Pisistratus than it ever had done before, so much so that the family at the head of the men of the coast, the Alcmionids, came home. We don't know if Megacles ever had it in him to reconcile with Pisistratus, but his son Cleisthenes certainly did, and he even got to hold the most important archonship in 526. In fact, a great deal of Pisistratus's opponents that fled after the Battle of Pelennus came home within two decades, and Cleisthenes was amongst these newly returned aristocrats, along with Miltiades of the Philaidae. Both of these guys are going to be very glad that they decided to return to Athens, as will their all too numerous descendants. Archons were elected every year, and seemed to have shared in the running of state. The Areopagus, Boule, and Ecclesia all seemed to have run normally, and Pisistratus, despite having lost power twice, seems to have remained as far from a control freak as a person can get, adopting a very hands-off management strategy. This suited Pisistratus perfectly. The day-to-day -day running of the city never interested him. He was a big-picture guy. And while the admin was being done by the Archons, Pisistratus concerned himself with how to permanently change the city for the better. He had already combated poverty fairly effectively, but still ruled over a divided country. And as a result, he started encouraging new religious festivals to bring people together. The ancient Greeks didn't have a weekend, instead they just had regular festivals, usually with a religious side to them, and used these as days off. Attica had many different festivals, but most of them were locally orientated. Pisistratus instead encouraged a new calendar of celebrations, held by the entire region at the same time. To support this policy and create more jobs, he renovated the Acropolis as part of a larger building project on the city of Athens himself. By doing this, he hoped to unite the people of Attica not only through religion and shared tradition, but through the city of Athens. Hosting the majority of the festivals in the city solidified Athens as the capital of Attica. It had already been the largest population centre and the political capital for a theoretically united Attica, but few who lived in the country would travel there regularly. Pisistratus knew that a great deal of his subjects held stronger feelings about their local town and local aristocrat than the greater Athenian territory. Pisistratus used the people's Ionian identity to help with this. Ionians were a subdivision of Greeks who occupied this area here, and according to their own history, the Ionians of Attica were all that remained of the original inhabitants of Greece on the Greek mainland. To help solidify this and win favour from other Ionian cities, Pisistratus purified the island of Delos. Uh, to purify means to remove all of the dead bodies from the island. Delos was the centre of the Ionian festival, a celebration held by the states that identified as part of the greater Ionian family. In doing this, Pisistratus helped transform a disunified, poor and isolated Attica into a wealthy and important state that was rapidly being noticed and admired by its neighbours. But having been around a long time, and no longer as naive as he might have been during his first two stints as tyrant, Pisistratus knew that success would still not guarantee the continuation of his rule. Many of the Argive mercenaries who had been with Pisistratus at the Battle of Pelennus were still employed throughout the tyranny. The only standing army slash police force slash bodyguard in the city. And so if anyone got any ideas about overthrowing the tyrant, they would have to take into consideration his large professional fighting force when doing so. The aristocrats didn't put up any fight though, quite possibly because the lives of their families were very much in Pisistratus's hands. When he first took power, Pisistratus encouraged them to collaborate with the regime, and to ensure that they did, he took a number of family members from each prominent clan and sent them to, of all places, Naxos. While they were there, they remained in the care of Pisistratus' good friend and trusted ally, Ligdamus. With this somewhat terrifying hostage-taking strategy in place, you'd think that the chances of anyone stepping out of line were fairly slim, but Pisistratus still didn't take any chances. His sons and a group of young and loyal aristocrats they surrounded themselves always had at least one of the archonships, meaning that the tyranny always had one foot in the door of official power. This mix of strategies kept Pisistratus in power for around two decades, until finally dying of natural causes in 526. He left Athens undoubtedly better than how he found it, and his stable and long rule meant that no matter what, 
Things would never go back to the way they had been before he took power. Athens was now stronger, more centralised, economically stable and peaceful. For his achievements, Pisistratus is one of the few Greek tyrants to be remembered fondly by his people even centuries after his death. This is more than can be said for his son, Hippias, who succeeded him. We'll get into the tyranny of Hippias, aided by his brother Hipparchus, next time.